All right, I want to welcome on my next guest. We've got two-time Super Bowl champion, New York Giants legend, Gary Reasons. Gary, how's everything going for you? Hey, Zach, everything's going great. Hope you're doing well, buddy. Absolutely, yeah. It's a wild time in the world right now, but we're a week away from football. So that's something to cheer about. Hopefully everybody's staying safe. Hopefully all the guys are being responsible. But I think that'll bring back some normalcy that maybe we really need. I hope so. I think so a little bit. You know, everybody seems to kind of get back in the groove when – fall is here when football is in here and you know fall weather is in the air we want those things we want those things to come back and uh you know everybody everyone is is uh, basically a creature of habit right so we all like these things to happen uh, like in the normal course of business the course of our lives but unfortunately 2020 has thrown us a bunch of wrinkles and uh, we're just not there right now but with football season approaching we've got some football underway already so a few collegiate games have picked off as well as some high school games I think that uh, football is in the air, and uh, it is coming big time. The NFL in almost two weeks, and it'll be here soon. Have you been watching any of the NBA in Orlando? I have watched a little of it. Unfortunately, I just can't get zeroed in on it. You know, it's just really? not, yeah, it's just not something that I gravitate towards. I used to be a huge basketball fan back in the '90s. I used to live in the Houston area, and uh, '80s and '90s when the Rockets were doing well, yeah. and, and I got a couple of championships. So that was that was a fun area for, era for me. But I kind of moved away from um, I moved away from basketball as a fan. You know, actually, basketball was my first love growing up. But but I moved away from basketball as a fan, and I think I'm, I have gravitated towards golf. I, I love golf. I love to watch golf. I listen to golf on the radio. I guess it's one of those things where if you're able to participate in the sport and still do it at a at a decent level, uh, that might 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 interest you more. And uh, you know that that may be the case with me. So, so, so you, I know you're probably a big fan of like Akeem, Akeem the Dream, Elijah one. You're not a big fan of these six five perimeter players on Houston just jacking well, up threes. There's no doubt that, that they're there <laughs> and they're, they're doing it well. You know, Harden's Harden's a special guy. He's, he's somebody that runs their their offense, and uh, you know, he, I I saw him his first days in, in Oklahoma City when we were up there. It's uh, it's a long long little ways to go, but uh, it was interesting to see him come into the league and how he's developed in, in his career. And, I do, you know, the perimeter players that you mentioned in the NBA today, they're swing men, you know, they're, you know, they're, uh, I would say Jordan-esque, but not Jordan-like, uh, but they're, they're trying to, trying to, you know, bring a different a vibe to the game. I don't know where the dominant big man is anymore. That's uh, maybe not existent in the NBA uh, uh, world right now, but I, I think that the, the guys on the outside, the perimeter guys, the guys that move the ball, shoot the ball, everybody shoots from three points. You don't have a three-point shot in your bag in the NBA right now as, as any type of a position player. You're not getting on the floor. <laughs> that's, no. that's what it comes down to. You may get the ball in open space. you got to take the shot, yeah. and that's what they look for. You see, I don't, I don't mind. I feel like in the fourth quarter, if, they're not, if they have not been hitting threes the whole game, they're not going to take them. It's just much more kind of balanced. It's just with the, all the threes, like swinging at the guy's got a wide open layup. No, no, no. Oh, Harden's out in the corner. Let me flip it over here. But last night, he, that, that kid a great defensive play blocking Dort. Dort, honestly, I was, I was jumped out of my seat for this Dort kid. I've never even seen him before. No, but it. Yeah, what's interesting, though, that the games back in, in the uh, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, you know, you're winning them in, in, the, in the scores of 90s, okay? <laughs> Low hundreds at the most. Now, with the prevalence of the three shot and also just throwing the ball up and down the court, and it moves really fast. You know, we're seeing typically 130s to 150s. It's, it's amazing that, that they're just going at that pace. And, and the accuracy, I kind of take that back to the football side, and the skill level in football has enhanced over the years with throwing and catching and the percentages of receivers catching the ball and quarterback, uh, you know, PBR ratings have gone through the roof because yeah. they're throwing, their accuracy is great, they're catching more balls. And in, in, in football, I can correlate it back to when seven-on-seven seven started in, in the junior high and high school age kids when they were growing up. And so that's been in the late 90s and 2000s, and that has put a great skill level in today's NFL players yeah. that, they did, that they didn't possess, you know, back when I played. So, you know, the numbers have changed, both in, 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 in all sports, I think, because of how things have been taught and the skill level has really improved. So I, so I, remember, so I know you said that your first love was basketball. When did you kind of pivot towards football? Full time. Well, in high school, I, I was a, I was an excellent football player. Played uh, played a bunch of positions. I was a linebacker on defense first and foremost. But I, I played a little quarterback, running back. I was a tight end. I was an all state tight end in high school. 
Um, you know, football was probably going to be my sport. I was I didn't have the great uh, leaping ability, or I played. I was I was uh, probably our best player on on offense for three years in high school, and um, you know, kind of ran ran our our basketball team to uh, be able to you know be all district and all and you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, I didn't think I had the skill level to go and compete at a super high level in college, so I gravitated towards football and. We focused on that uh, my senior year and, you know, did well. Won't wind up getting going to a great university in Northwestern State. And and uh, it's kind of, you know, a little history now that I, I made the right choice. What was your first experience like when you did get there? Because I know you had a big personality already there and now head coach of the uh, LSU Tigers at Orgeron. Do you remember remember your first experience meeting him? Well, Ed and I came in the same year. We uh, we played we played ball together. We were freshmen the same year. So we played four years all together. And, uh uh, I, I had not been previously introduced to the Cajun culture until uh, I went to Northwestern, and uh, there were other players on the team that were from the, from South Louisiana. And, uh, it really is a an eye-opening experience to understand how these people live and how they they treat each other. I mean, they're the most caring people, they're the most fun-loving people, and at the same time, you know, they're the guys that are gonna you want them on your side, you want them on your team because these guys are tough, hard-nosed physical ball players and Ed played defensive tackle in front of me as a linebacker. And so, you know, I have to, I have to nod my head to him. He, you know, he, he kept me clean some of the sometimes so that I could make a tackle here and there. Uh, and he was a good player in his own right. So, so Ed, Ed did a good job in college and I'm really glad that he's had the success he's had. You know, he, he knew that he loved football. He loved sports. Uh, you know, took a coaching path. I took a playing path and, and good to see his success that, that he had over, over the years and now on with LSU. And, He's the right man for the job in, in Louisiana, and I'm very glad that he's had the, the great success that he's had. And I'll just have to say this, go Tigers. I, that, that gets me so amped anytime he says it. And he says it all the time, which I think is perfect. Go Tigers, go Tigers. Was, was the NFL on your radar, or were you just focused on college football at the time? You know, I, 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 everybody grows up and they dream to play, you know, at the, at the highest level and everything. But you know what? It wasn't my focus. Um, you know, coming out of high school, my, no one in my family had ever been to college. Uh, wow. actually, no, one, no one out of Crowley High School in the south of Fort Worth had gone on to play major college football. I was basically the first. So, you know, uh, the recruiters weren't coming through there. And I, but so I didn't really have the NFL in my radar, but, you know, everybody liked to see it. It was, it was only dur after my sophomore year, essentially during my sophomore year in college that, uh, you know, I was, I was a, and I was an all player, all, you know, all, all, all state player, basically all Louisiana player in, in Northwestern State. But then I got selected as a first team All American that year um, and went on to, you know, have you know, three consecutive seasons and, you know, was the first ever FCS, one uh, AA, uh, three time All American in, 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 that, in the history of that league. So I, for that, that division. So I, that was pretty cool. And so my, my linebacker coach at the time, in my sophomore year, Actually, the previous year had been a scout for the Dallas Cowboys. Oh. And so that fall, after that, that season, he called me into his office. He said, Gary, I just want to let you know where I think you're at. And he said, I said, he said, not only do I think you could play in the NFL, he said, I think today you could be their starting middle linebacker for the Dallas Cowboys. Here I am, a 19-year-old sophomore <laughs> at, at Northwestern State, and uh, just hearing that, and, and then the accolades come with the All-Americans all, all and all those kinds of things. Uh, then you kind of look at, okay, what could happen? So now I go and play two additional years, didn't have the opportunity to come out in, uh, early and forego a senior year, but uh, back then, so, you know, I might just play, you know, just didn't worry about it, just, just everything happened and fell into place and wound up being selected by a wonderful organization that uh, went on to have great success in the NFL. What was your draft process like? Where did you think you were going? How did it go? You know, the draft process for us, we, you know, we didn't have a lot of players that had gone to the NFL. We had a few previously. You know, though I played in college with Bobby A. Bear, who, who, you know, went into USFL, won a couple of championships there as a quarterback. Mark Duper was on our team. He, he was a second-round pick of the Dolphins, uh, you know, before, before me. And uh, so we had some experience with, uh, with the draft process. And then, you know, for me, I, I just tried to do as best as I can. And, you know, there were some scouts telling me they expected me to go late first round, second round, third round. Um, I actually fell in the fourth round. And, you know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't take any, any bad thing about that. Um, that that just, just happened to be where I was drafted. And it, it worked out well. I don't, I, don't, I don't hold any ill feelings towards that process. Unfortunately, back in the NFL, in that timeline, as far as the economics of the game, 
where you were drafted meant a lot as far as your pay scale uh, because they basically slotted players and you just couldn't break out of that slot. You know, but they're always going to pay the first and second round players a heck of a lot more than they're ever going to pay over the course of a career, even uh, the third and fourth, or second, the, the third and fourth round and, and later players or free agents. So that the, the economics of, of the, the draft position over the long run probably was a, a little detriment to, 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 to an excellent career that I had with nine years in the league. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't complain about it. I had a great run, a couple of championships, great, great memories and, Football has been central in my life. I've been involved in football, Matt, since I was eight years old, uh, Zach, rather, that I was in 2008. And so you know, for 50 plus years, I've been involved with football because I broadcast college football, been doing that for 26, 27 years. Um, and it, it is just a blast being able to talk about football and you hear, hear me talking. I don't have a shortage of kind of weight of, of, of talking points. I, 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 can, I can throw out there quite a bit. I have a question. Who, When you first got to the Giants, who were you more intimidated by? Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, or Lawrence Taylor? <laughs> well, you know, all, all of them three, uh, three great uh, characters in themselves. Uh, Parcells, obviously, the, the head coach at that, at that time with the, with the Giants and was in that role a couple of years. And, and he's, he was just getting the team that he needed under his belt. The 1984 draft, which I was part of with the Giants, was really um, uh, one that set things in motion to have the Giants have success and perennial success. And we had uh, wound up winning a couple championships, and you know, in, in due course, uh, you know, Parcells has his had his has his things about him that he does as a coach. But get down to your skin; he's a great people person. He knows a lot about his players. He knows what makes you tick, and that's what that's what he uses to get people motivated. He always says to us, "This is Gary he says, you got to treat people fairly, but you don't treat everybody equally." What I mean by that is there's different things that he would do with players that didn't seem fair perhaps to everybody, but he, was, he made it fair amongst each individual guy and uh, can't go into too, too many details about that, but, but, it, but, it, but it worked out. And you know, when, when we, we talked about the Bill Belichick and Bill was a, our defense coordinator, linebacker coach, uh, my whole time there, almost my whole time there with the Giants before he left and, and got his first head coaching job. But uh, you know, just a great guy to work with. You know, the work ethic is really what, what Bill Belichick was all about, the preparation and still today, the word that de defines Bill Belichick is preparation. There's nothing, there's really no more than that. He is the most prepared coach at every, at every step, of the, a step of the way. You've got to have a plan to succeed. If something goes wrong, you've got to have a plan to overcome that. It's a challenge. Bill was very, very good at planning and making things happen. And then also in game, he had great ability to make corrections and, and, and gain corrections. Uh, on the fly, so to speak, and so I, his football acumen is, 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 as you know, off the charts, and he's, he's just done a great job. No nonsense guy. You know, basically what you hear and what you see on television as we've interviewed and everything, it's pretty much, pretty much Bill. He, he just, he just communicates and in football sense, you got to get it done, you got to go do it. If you don't do it, make it somebody else, next, next guy up. So that, that's kind of how we roll for a long time there with the Giants. And uh, you know, with, with, with number 56, I'll tell you a quick little story here. Uh, you know, when I first got to the Giants, the, they drafted me and they brought us in as, as rookies in, in mid camp. And so you know, here we are. I'm, I'm beating my uh, my locker, my teammates, and you know, soon to be teammates. Uh, uh, you know, they're coming in, and we have we had mini camp practices and outside. The last day of practice, we come into the defensive meeting room. Belichick stands up and he goes, he goes, "You veterans, you're all done. Get out of here. Get out of here. You rookies, just hang in here." And so you know, everybody walked out, and so Bill. In his own little way, he says, you know what? If you want to play football for the New York Giants, this is what it takes. He says, get the lights. So he sits in the chair, kicks his feet up on the desk, and we had reel-to-reel -reel uh, film back then. So he cl clicks on the projector, and what he had put in there is a, a few-minute highlight reel of Lawrence Taylor in his earliest days as a Giant and some of the things that he did. And what he showed us as incoming rookies to the New York football giants is this is what it takes to be successful. And here's Lawrence covering kickoffs. Here's Lawrence covering punts. Here's Lawrence rushing from the outside, causing a, 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 a almost hitting the quarterback, but he gets, it hits him as he throws the ball. He gets himself up, runs down, makes the tackle and causes a fumble, picks the ball up and heads the other way. There were some inhuman type of, of, uh, of plays that, that Belichick had put together in a string there that that's the type of dedication, sacrifice, and ability that they're looking for in players to move forward with, with that team. And so 
in that short, really, you know, two to three minute clip reel he put, he set the level of expectation with us as incoming rookies to the New York football giants of what it would take to be successful. And I think that was an excellent move by Belichick. I always reference that with people all the time. Set the level of expectation with whatever you're doing, what you want to establish, what you want to get out of your personnel, what you want to get out of your, your, your goals and achievements. And, you know, if you, if you set that bar high, you got to aspire to it. But you know, you got you got to set the goal, first of all, to get there. And, and Belichick did that correctly with us. I got a question for you. Ask anybody that played in the NFC East, what's the most annoying NFC East fan base? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, too mean to anybody, but you know, back in, back in the day when, when we played in Philadelphia, it was, it was not a friendly confines area. Every single were, person has said Philadelphia. It's yeah, not there, there was, uh, <laughs> yeah, there was, there were some times when, well, oh, let's face it, any visiting team in, into any home stadium, Everyone knows where the visiting teams, players, families sit. In other words, the tickets that they block for the, the families of the players and the coaches that are coming in. So uh, in Philadelphia, obviously a quick ride down from, the, from Northern Jersey to uh, you know, see a game. Well, it got to the point where a lot of, a lot of wives didn't want to go to games because it was uh, you know, fairly abusive and, you know, a few things thrown here and there and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But so back in the day, they, they were a lot more liberal with what, what they would allow happen in the state, stadium. Uh, today, it's not so much, but uh, that, that, uh, those days, and I, I'm telling you more from my wife's perspective. I, yeah. I wasn't turning around looking to see what's going on, but, you know, I'm, I'm hearing this uh, from her directly, and uh, I certainly can understand that. So answer your question um, directly. I think Philadelphia probably was one of the more spirited and challenging places. Although I love to play in, in, in Washington, it was it was a cool place as well. That's awesome. Um, no, because I know they had a, a, a jail in the, <laughs> which is yeah. wild to me. So yeah, that's yeah, that's incredible. No, that, that's wild. Um, so what was it like your so your first Super Bowl? What was that? What was that season like? Do you have a feeling that something was different? Like, all right, we, we've got enough. Well, I tell you, you know, it started in 1984 when we first came in as rookies with myself, Carl Banks, um, you know, as linebackers onto the team, and um, and we, you know, we had a had a great group, and then we had some other offensive players fall in, and you know, we built uh, on our on our chemistry as a team, on the dependency of what we would do and how we play smart, physical football. So we prided ourselves on physical play. It's, we, we, we lined up, and teams didn't want to line up against the football, New York football giants because, you know, the physical play that we had as a defense. Then our offense was built to move, but move smartly and physically through the run game and, you know, play action passing and so forth. And we didn't make mistakes. Um, you know, mistakes, turnovers were, you know, were, were a premium, and we, we just didn't make those a, a lot. So in 1984, we got to the playoffs, went to the second round of the playoffs actually before being ousted. And then in 1985, we got to the playoffs again, you know, just continued to move, move better, um, played Chicago and they got, they got the, the championship that year. In 86, we, we were positioned and our team went together. So we're, we're taking guys who have been playing together for the past three years or more in some instances and, and developed the chemistry of our football team. And it just was, was propelling us to have some continued success every single week. We went 14-2 and two in the regular season, probably should have won all, all the games, probably should have gone unblemished. Uh, you know, we had a couple of stumbles there, but uh, it, was the, it was the chemistry. We knew how to play together. We knew what it took to win. We knew what, what was our winning formula, and we dominated. We literally dominated in 1986. It was, it was that. And, and we would have done so in 87 and beyond. 87 was the strike year. Um, so I was, I was our player rep with the Giants back then. And so I'm you know, basically leaving the guys out on strike. And unfortunately, when we came back after the, the, the they call them the replacement games, you may be too young to remember these, but the, they, they actually counted those games on the record of the players that they had brought in off of buses and practice fields, wherever they could across the country. And they, you know, they played four and four games. The Giants were over four. The, 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 the Giants, the uh, uh, the leadership didn't didn't really do a heck of a lot of recruiting, and you didn't didn't put a whole lot of work into that effort to, to get a feel the team. So it wound up being 0 and 4 when we came back, and we struggled uh, a little bit in '87, but got back there in '90, and and you know won it again because we just kind of built another another up to another plateau and, and dominated again. I have a question: How did you yourself stand out, knowing you were playing alongside Harry Carson, Lawrence Taylor, and Carl Banks? 
Well, I, I never found, you know, tried to find a way to stand out. I just did my job. Um, I was a, I was a guy who got up, I, you know, kind of like the lunch pail guys that you, know, you, you like to see. And we, we kind of had that mantra of, you know, just being physical and just, um, you know, anything that you could do to help the team. I was, I was our backup kicker. You know, really? Know, yeah, I, I kicked off in the NFL, and you know, I've had, I've had experiences because we've had kickers go down making tackles and so forth. I used, to, I used to, I kicked off in college. So I was our kicker in college. I kicked off through high school. So it was um, a fun thing. I, I have, I have a sport toe shoe. I have it over here. I don't think I've got it on the shelf here, but the, uh, I, I carried that to every game I played in the NFL, a square toed shoe, because I was our backup kicker on the yeah. team. So anyway, so the more you can do really kind of mentality and, you know, be involved in special teams. I was our, I was our fullback on our punt team for, for you know, all my entire career. And that is the critical position. That is the quarterback of the punt team. And if you look back in some of the highlights, you know, there's, there's been some key times where, you know, I made some, um, you know, in on our NFC championship game in 1990, I called a fake punt, audible to it at the line of scrimmage and, and uh, took off with it and set us up for a score to, to help us win the game. So, so I'm going to get on the Super Bowl 25. That's, that's wild. So I saw, I know you were telling me that um, they renamed your high school stadium after you? Yeah, four or five years ago, they um, um, they contacted me and said the, uh, the school board and the high school um, wanted to dedicate the field and name it after me, and I was you know just basically taken aback. That was a, such such a great honor. Um, you know, previously after we won the Super Bowl, my high school uh, retired my jersey number. Uh, in my in my after my senior year in college, the university at, in the in the spring banquet that I attended. They retired my jersey in college, number 34, four again high school. Um, my number 55 from the Giants is still running around up there, so I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't get that number, I didn't get that number retired. But when I got the call that uh, the school is going to uh, dedicate the field after me and name it, it's pretty cool. So I, I see right here in my office, I've got Gary Reason's field, and it's, it's called awesome. Crowley Eagles right there. I've got a, a replica banner of what they have right on the scoreboard. They, they may be one uh, a smaller size, but that's a great honor. Um, you know, so the, that that legacy that I had as an athlete in high school, I was an all sport athlete. So I played five sports. Uh, you know, one year and as a sophomore, I got to get five letters. Um, I played football, basketball, baseball, uh, track, and, and golf. So I, I uh, you know, pretty pretty gifted as an athlete and able able to do a lot of things. And but uh, the stadium being named after me or the field rather being named after me was, was truly a great honor. Is somebody wearing 55 for the Giants now? I don't know. It's been used uh, over the years <laughs> since I left, uh, you know, by several players. So it's one of those. I mean, you know, even, even the great Harry Carson, 53, is, is uh, still being used. Really? Yeah, yeah. They, they still use that one. They still use uh, uh, Banks' number. You know, you only have a limited number of players that they can uh, – they can put their numbers in the rafter and you know some of those guys you know 56 i don't think there's ever gonna you know you gotta put a 56 up for the giants in the rafters and uh, i didn't get i don't think i'm not trying to aspire myself that i got to that level i mean i was a i was a critical part of our teams and uh, glad to have had a lot of key key moments and great success with the team to help us win and that's all i was about was about winning is there any like friendly sparring between your Giants defense and like the 2000s Giants defense with like Strahan and Umanora Umanor or anything? No, Strahan knows that we're better. It, it's, just hands <laughs> down. it's just hands down. I, you know, uh, they, they had a good run. They really did. You know, they, they won a lot of football games on the defensive side of the ball, which what we did too with the Giants early on. And um, it's not something that it, what Giants fans are like. They love that type of play. They love smart, physical dominant defense where if you can't get if you can't score in the Giants defense guess what you're not going to lose so you, your chances are winning or go up significantly and when you put a great defense out there uh, it really is a, a mark of a I think an excellent team there's you don't win it all with offense in today's game in the NFL there is a great amount of offense the rules are set up to be a lot, lot more of an offensive game so you know, it's a little bit different but you know the our giant defense compared to the others that were there were excellent defenses. I, mean, I think we played a, a little bit better game that, that they may yeah. have. What are your thoughts on this year's group defensively? I know it's a rebuilding year. I, I think it's still too early to tell. I hope the Giants defense plays plays well. They've got some pieces that they brought in there, I think, that are going to be able to 
give them a chance to be successful. And the, the, the key, Zach, in any team is just continuity, okay? When you can get players that know how to play together and understand what your defensive linemen are doing if you're a linebacker and your defensive backs are doing, and, and if you know where everybody's going to be and they're consistently being able to perform, uh, you're going to have success. You don't have any question marks. Everybody knows what they're going to do, and then you can grow as a team as a unit and how to function. Uh, it takes a little bit of time, but I think if the Giants make some strides they, uh, early on here in, in the season, they'll be able to have a good defense. I think it's going to take that because I think the offense is probably further behind than the, uh, the Giants' defense right now. Uh, the offensive line needs to, needs to emerge. They've got to find a way to uh, bring – four or five guys there together. I don't care who they are. I'm not naming names. Uh, but they've got to find a way to get a, a consistent group of play together at a high level that will give Saquon Barkley, Daniel Jones, a chance to do what they do. And, and, and you know, I, I, I name those two on offense because you know, they're, they're superstars. They can be superstars. I mean, Saquon has earned that right, and Daniel Jones has the tools to do that. Uh, in his arsenal, he's, he's shown that he's a very capable player, but I think the offensive line has to emerge from the Giants for them to, uh, to really be a, a, you know, any kind of a difference maker for them and, and to be a contender potentially in, in the NFC East and beyond. So, so I have a question. When did, when did you kind of know you were kind of close, like ready kind of to retire? Well, it's just all age. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, the father time is, is really the worst enemy for any NFL player because, you know, it's, it's bigger, stronger, faster. You know, the, the younger guys are coming up. They've they're, they're, they're got a lot more energy and so forth. You know the game. You play smarter. You can play harder when you, when you have some experience. Uh, but Father Time really, really does do that. So I noticed that something when I was 28, 29 years old, my metabolism was slowing down. So I didn't used to have to worry about when I was a player, really eating and diet and all that kind of stuff. Kind of, kind of maintained a natural, natural weight that I wanted to play. And I played about 240, 45 as a line, linebacker in the NFL. And then, you know, in my seventh, eighth, and ninth year, I, I gravitated up to 250, 55. And I, I just, you know, it just the metabolism just wasn't the same. And, you know, and plus, let's, let's face it, everybody loses a step in speed. When you get a little older, it's just it's just, it's just a natural thing. It's called father time. Some guys can 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 make that last a little bit longer. Others can't. So I played my last year in the NFL. I got hurt in training camp with the Giants in '92. Uh, we got I got an injury, and they released me injured. Where they they had hoped to sign me back, but I signed with the Bengals and played with the Bengals in '92, and then basically hung them up after that. I just uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about the about the Bengals, but uh, just didn't want just didn't want to go back. That's interesting. And I know you've been involved in a lot of different businesses um, after football with broadcasting. I know you have a tech background. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate to be able to do a lot of things. Stay, like I said, close to football, started broadcasting when I got out of the league in 94 with ABC Sports. You know, did a national collegiate uh, broadcast package, worked with some great guys, worked with, with Keith Jackson, uh, Brad Musburger, you know, all, all, they're all guys that are just great um, a natural's in there, right? And then I moved on after, after four years over to Fox Sports here in, in the Texas area, Fox Sports Southwest. I've been with, with Fox now for 22, 23 years, That's I guess. Awesome. Um, so I've, I've been a longtime collegiate uh, broadcaster, co cover most of the, the Big 12 conference in this area and other, and other, and other conferences. Uh, and also I'm, I'm the lead color football analyst for the, the Texas high school football package that Fox Southwest puts on here annually. So I, I'm very much involved with football still. At the same time, that's just a fall weekend job. I, I've, I've been involved in, in business and business development, marketing, executive uh, for, for, for sales with, with large enterprise technology companies. And um, within the sports media entertainment industry, I've really been blessed to be able to kind of, you know, deliver a value prop to an organization and share, you know, some solutions that could help them. And currently what I do now is I have a group called Pro Athletes Team. And we are, you know, myself and former professional athletes and other business executives who come together and I've put together under an umbrella, under pro athletes teams, some financial services and also some healthcare programs in the healthcare area we're working on right now, to where we really bring value to companies, larger companies that are self-funded and they're self-funded health plans. In other words, they're a thousand member employees and they've got a, they run their own healthcare health plan. And most companies are that way because it's just, just economics work out better for them. But we have three major solutions that we provide, a, a surgical solution, that uh, can save them a significant amount of money and get to drive better outcomes and how we, how we deliver it on, on high-cost specialty drugs. There are some drugs that are 
cost five thousand dollars a month, ten thousand, you know, or more, and it's, it's there's no end in sight. We have a solution there, and then we also have something that we work with with a total population health and wellness for an organization. So we've got really good solutions that we have, and uh, and literally, you know, for a, a one thousand member em employee group. We could, on average, uh, typically yield over the three programs about two million dollars in annual savings per thousand employees. So, pretty, pretty significant on what we're able to drive as a value prop to those groups. So, that's what I do. I communicate that with uh, with the directly to the organization, the CFO, CEO, and or their benefit consultants. And then from there, uh, you know, we take off with whatever program they want to run with. They want one of them or all three of them. It can be bolt-on solutions that work. Then we uh, we put everything in place for them. So. It's, it's a very fulfilling uh, thing that I do and, and able to continue to do so. Yeah. Uh, but first and foremost, I'm, I'm still involved in sports, and, and uh, that's, that's kind, of, kind, of, kind of a fun thing to be a part of. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll put all the links to everything in here to redirect people so they can go find it, but that's awesome. And I said, one last question for you. How cool is it to get that call from the College Football Hall of Fame? Well, that is uh, probably the, 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 the biggest accolade that I could have ever received. Um, there are so many millions, I say millions, of players who have played college football over the years. And to be um, selected in the very first group of players who have played, and not the FBS level, but at the smaller college level, FCS, 1AA, and, and lower, I was among the inaugural group in 1996 of, of players inducted to the College of All of Fame. Not anything that was on my radar, not anything that was uh, I expected, but I was in my home in Houston, Texas, which was spring actually. I lived in Houston for a long time. And uh, I got that FedEx letter. I, don't, I wasn't expecting anything. They brought it in. I sat in my office, pulled it open, and opened this letter and, and, and started reading it. And Gary Reasons, I'd like to inform you that you've been selected for enshrinement for the College Football Hall of Fame. And you know, you, you got a grown man who, who turned to tears um, because, you know, the meaning of what that was is, is so impactful to me because I know the impact of football and the reach that it has. Uh, one thing to play in the NFL, but to make it to a level to where, you know, of all the collegiate players, I'm talking millions of players since the game has been on, there's, there's less than 2,000 guys in that enshrined in there. Um, that, that's a that's a big deal, and so I, I respect that greatly. I was, you know, our group had Walter Payton, Terry Bradshaw, uh, Neil Lomax, uh, a number of guys. I, you know, the list goes on. There was about ten of us that I, that I, you know, you, when you look back and say we were the very first of all the small college players inducted. Uh, that, that's that's pretty special, and so that is probably the greatest accolade that I've ever been uh, that has been bestowed upon me in, in, in football. That's awesome. That, that was before Walter started getting sick, right? It was right around the same time. Um, you know, he had just had, he had still had some, some effects there in, in, in 96. Um, and yeah, but he did attend and, um, you know, and since I, I, I actually do uh, every year, I brought, excuse me, I, I uh, MC the FCS national awards, which are uh, provided by Stats Perform for uh, the Walter Payton Award, oh, cool. uh, Eddie Robinson Award for the coach and, uh, and a few others. But so I've gotten to know Walter's family um, uh, and Walter, but you know, but they just to carry on the legacy of, of him and his, what he meant to the NFL, what he's meant to collegiate sports and what, what he's meant as a person is really, uh, really unique. And, and yes, it's, a, it's 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 an honor to be a part of a, be a name in the, in the same same paragraph with uh, with one of the greats of all time in Walter Payton. There's a, it's a funny story about that. I don't know. I I so the, I've been doing the this podcast for since about April. One of the first um former athletes I interviewed was Bryant McKinney, who played with his son Jared at Miami. And I was asking him if he ever got the chance to meet Walter. He said no, maybe over the phone. But he remember after Walter passed, Jared went home for the funeral, and he said apparently. He and Ed Reed decided to throw a small get together for Jarrett when he got back and invited a few people and half the school showed up. So apparently they started doing it every semester and it became like a yeah. tradition. So that, I thought that was just, yeah. just, just a little get together. Yeah, just a little bit, just a little get together. I don't know if you're doing it this year, but yeah, Jared, hopefully Jared, not. 
Hopefully not this Darren time. tells those stories about his dad and some of the gatherings that they've had at their home. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, they're pretty lively. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really all the questions I really had for you. I just wanted to thank you again for chatting for a few minutes. And then for people that want to find you on social media, is there an easy way to do that for them? Yeah, for me, I'm, I'm a LinkedIn guy. Just hit me up on, on LinkedIn if you uh, want to get me on uh, on Twitter at Gary Reasons. Um, it's pretty simple. And to reach me with uh, if I work at Pro Athletes Team, it's Gary at ProAthletesTeam.com. Um, it's pretty simple. And you, you hit me up by email, and uh, I'll get back to you. We'll help your your company. We'll help your uh, your groups. Uh, you know, save significant revenue, money, and hard line dollars. And it's it's amazing what we're able to do for folks. So. Happy to help. Awesome, awesome. Man. Well, this has been a ton of fun. Just wanted to thank you again. Uh, can't wait for NFL to kick off in a few weeks, getting some college, not all college. I don't know, Big Ten's deciding a little bit, but this has been awesome. I just want to thank you again, and this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. If you want to you want to tune in on Saturday the 25th uh, from AT&T Stadium here in, in Arlington, Texas, uh, where the Cowboys play, I'm broadcasting two national high school games for, for, um, for Fox uh, that day be one at 4 p.m. and one at 8 p.m. Central Time. So check it out. It's, it's going to be some fun uh, high school, Texas high school football. You'll love it and uh, enjoy. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I'll, 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 I'll plug that in here too, but for sure. But this has been a lot of fun. So I want to thank you again. Thanks, Zach. Take care, buddy.